Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 10th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as on the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, by way of background, Michael and I start the show by doing a brief review of the evolution of our thinking on fiscal policy these past 10 years. Then we dive into the top three. First, we take a peek behind the curtain at what other taxes the governor may have in mind this session. Second, why despite the claims of some, a spending cap doesn't solve or even much help with the state's current fiscal problem. And third, we quickly mentioned a debate on fiscal issues that occurred Tuesday and which we will post also on these pages later this week. And now, let's join Michael. We've been on quite a journey these last few years, Brad. We've uh, talked about a lot of stuff. We've kind of uh, come quite a long way from some of our original discussions, um, which included, I think, you know, in our first pushes, we were trying to get the state on track uh, essentially by uh, you know, cutting the budgets. You and I were on the same page on that, cutting the budgets. And slowly over the course of the last three or four years, if we watch what's happened, uh, our positions have slightly changed. I mean, yours and mine, uh, I mean, I'm still looking for that magical cut. I don't know if it can be done. I'm not sure that it can be done because I don't think there's a political will. You've moved into a new direction to try and change the discussion to a point of finding a way to do it with a mix of uh, cuts and new revenues and so it's it's been an interesting journey, um, and I think uh, we're going to continue that today. Yeah, I, I would make one observation. That was twenty billion dollars ago. True. That we start that we started this journey. It was at a time when we still had substantial savings um, uh, in the bank, both in both in the statutory budget reserve and in the constitutional budget reserve, uh, and uh, and t- talk of. Uh, uh, PFD cuts was 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 not even in the mix. Uh, since that time, we've gone through more than $12 billion of constitutional budget reserve. We've gone through more than $5 billion of statutory budget reserve, and we've cut the PFD, withheld, or the government's withheld from the PFD more than $3 billion. So, I mean, that, that changes things over time, right? It, 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 it depletes the, the investment base. It depletes the the, the ability to bridge over uh, to uh, to a different uh, environment and uh, and and really reduces your options and and to a significant degree ties your hands. No, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think that's fair. Uh, like I said, I'm still not excited about any kind of idea that uh, you know, unfortunately, taxes Alaskan simply because. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm worried about what those new revenues would mean because they've already shown a complete and total disregard for any kind of fiscal discipline. So I'm always concerned that any new revenue will just lengthen this this glide path. But uh, at the same time, I recognize the necessity to at least have the conversation about it, and if possible, direct the conversation to the least painful or least damaging. Uh, tax uh, that we can discuss. And I think that's why, I mean, I enjoy having you back on the program every week to talk about it. Um, let's uh, let's start off with your number one today, uh, speaking of uh, taxes and everything else. And number one is uh, a discussion of where the Dunleavy administration may be going in the form of their choice as far as new revenues are going. Uh, there was a, there was a, 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 tweet, a tweet out from Matt Buxton uh, that discuss this specifically. Uh, give us, give us, give us the rundown. Well, and then there was a there 
was an article. Matt did an article in the Midnight uh, in the Midnight Sun about it L- last week during the the budget um, the conversations uh, before uh, the Senate and House um, about the supplemental budget. One of the items in the supplemental budget uh, that came up was about six hundred thousand dollars, if I can remember, if I remember recall correctly for uh, an outside consultant to advise the administration on taxes, uh, not only um, uh, uh, respond, well, re- responding to any legislative ideas on taxes and preparing the administration to have a discussion um, about taxes. Um, and, and the question came up during the course of the uh, discussion about that supplemental budget about what, the, what, what did the administration have in mind uh, with respect to uh, the six hundred thousand dollars with respect to this consulting study, and uh, Mike Barnhill, who uh, was then the Commissioner of Revenue is now the deputy Commissioner of revenue um, was was discussing that and took the opportunity sort of pressed the envelope and took the opportunity to to discuss in fairly great detail what the administration had in mind in that, and in the course of that um, said that uh, w- was encouraging the administration uh, to have a converse- conversation, uh, or was encouraging the legislature to have a conversation um, about taxes. Um, it, it, what he said during that conversation was, to be quite candid, this is to quote uh, Matt Buxton's quote of Mike, to be quite candid, we are actually hoping at the Department of Revenue that folks here in the legislature would like to take up the subject of new or incremental changes to, exi- to existing taxes. In specific, perhaps we could talk about sales taxes. Uh, this is what what Barnhill said. If you will recall, uh, in the in the OMB uh, 10-year plan, there are five scenarios uh, that the administration lays out for the direction uh, that we can go forward. Two of them, one of them is, is essentially to fill the deficit by uh, taxes only new taxes only, and that's, that's not what the administration is proposing. But, but the fifth scenario, what the, scenario, what the administration calls balanced, uh, has uh, several things in it, uh, about $700, $600 million in, uh, in spending cuts below um, uh, spending plus inflation. Uh, that's that's uh, cuts below inflation, the, the inflation level. Um, uh, PFD restructuring in the form of moving it to POMV 5050, uh, which creates about seven hundred million dollars in new revenue for the government, um, and then a fi- and then a layer in there five hundred million dollars for taxes. And and there's been discussion about what kind of taxes the administration really had in mind for that. I think I think Mike Barnhill's comments about uh, specifically trying to generate a discussion with the with the legislature about sales taxes uh, gives an indication of what of what the administration has in mind. Here's my problem with that. Sales taxes are regressive. Uh, that means sales taxes hit middle and lower income uh, Alaska families harder uh, than they do uh, the top 20% of, of Alaska families. And, and that's just, that's, that, that is always going to be the case with sales taxes. I know some say, well, you can have exclusions for food and, and, uh, uh, and, and health and, and other things, right. and that, that would help. Uh, soften the burden on lower income families, but sales taxes, regardless of how many exclusions exclusions you include in them, are always going to hit, are always going to be regressive, and are always going to hit middle and lower income Alaska families harder than top 20%. The reason is that they exclude, uh, sales taxes exclude the portion of income that goes to savings or to investments. If you view income broadly, what sales taxes does, what sales taxes do is divide income into two pieces. One piece is the portion you spend, and that would be subject to sales taxes. And then the other portion is the portion you don't spend or the portion that goes to savings or investments or it could be spent outside the state. The, 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 the portion of income that is saved is much higher uh, for the in the top 20 percent than it is middle and lower income families they, they just don't have the they, they don't have the capacity uh, in the sense of spare income right uh, to, to be saving so there's just a, a greater burden on of, of sales taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families and I and, and it troubles me that that here we're talking about PFD restructuring 
which would, in essence, be a regressive tax. There would be some PFD cuts as a result of that from the current statute and would be a re regressive tax. And layering, a sa layering sales taxes on top of PFD cuts is just another regressive tax. So you've got, you've got one, one step that's burdening middle and lower income Alaska families, and then you layer on top of that a second step which burdens uh, uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. And I just think that's the wrong direction. Well, and I think, you know, again, there's been lots of talk about the variety of taxes that would uh, best serve Alaskans. And, it, you know, of course, with the progressive income tax, Shelley Hughes has also talked a little bit about the sales tax idea. Uh, it seems to be the most palatable of taxes that the Republican, I mean, they're completely and totally against uh, a progressive income tax. And, and I think for good reason. Um, you know, the, the Republican Party has flirted with the idea and it's been talked about in circles as, you know, the only acceptable tax is the one that essentially spreads the burden. The argument, of course, is is that it spreads the burden to many of the tourists and visitors who come into the state and things like that. Um, but I, I noticed that even in all these discussions, Brad, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about the idea of a flat tax. Uh, and again, I'm I, j just to be clear with the listeners, look, I'm not a fan of taxes. I don't necessarily want taxes. But as Brad has pointed out, if we don't have this conversation they will steamroll right over the top of you and give you the tax that you probably least want because you refuse to talk about it as an as an option. We've gone through the cuts route, and there is no political will to actually cut further, it seems like. Uh, maybe that'll change come this next election cycle. God, I hope it does. But uh, otherwise, if we don't at least have the discussion or try and shape the discussion, uh, we could end up with a progressive income tax or a sales tax that is, uh, you know, super regressive on top of the PFD cuts that we already have. Yeah, and and the flat tax. I think Michael, the 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 conversations I've had with people in the administration and the conversations I've had elsewhere is is that well, a a a, a flat tax is an income tax, right? It's an it's a tax on income. Thus, it is an income tax. And I think there is just this allergic reaction. Among uh, among among people to anything that with here here but here's my response to that every tax is a tax on income um, that's what you have to pay taxes with your income and and all these all that these different forms of taxes are are just different ways of slicing and dicing your income in a way to get a predetermined outcome of who really pays the tax. A sales tax is an income tax. It's just a tax on the portion of your income that you're using to buy goods. And it excludes the portion of your income that is that is used to save or invest or, or spent outside uh, of the state, in the case of a statewide sales tax. And so a sales tax is really just an income tax that's designed in a way to, to exclude or to protect those who save or invest uh, uh, more of their income than others. And, and that tilts toward the top 20%. So you're... <laughs> People who respond, well, a flat tax is an income tax. I mean, they're just they're missing the point. Every tax is an income tax. It 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 is it is designed in a way to get at more of a portion of your income than than other portions of your income. A PFD cut is an income tax. It's a targeted tax on the portion of your income that comes from the PFD. And because a higher percentage of of middle and lower income families income comes from PFD income, um, a higher percentage of it does, targeting that tax on PFD incomes results in a regressive tax, results in hitting middle and lower income uh, Alaska, Alaskans harder. I think, I mean, those who don't want, that, those in the top 20 percent who don't want to pay a proportionate share of the cost of government have figured out if they just say income tax, that, that you've got this knee-jerk reaction going on by others uh, who try to run the opposite direction and say, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not, we're not in favor of an income tax. Um, and, and so that's what they're trying to label the flat tax uh, as an income tax and, and, and beat it down by using that label. But again, a sales tax is an income tax. It's, right. just, a portion, it's just a tax on the portion of your income that, uh, that you spend on buying goods and services. Uh, I got about a minute here before we have to go to break, but Ace in the chat room says, uh, wait a second, you're leaving out the tourism that comes here and will pay into those sales tax, but not an income tax as well. Well, two answers to that. 
one, we, we do we are taxing tourism through local taxes. Uh, almost every um, uh, uh, major uh, port of call for uh, tourists has a state sales tax, and 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 so they're getting hit. And secondly, a sales tax or a, or a sales tax would leave out non-resident uh, workers uh, on the slope and elsewhere the income that non-resident workers on the slope and elsewhere are bringing in. So we are getting a portion of tourists through local sales taxes. We are getting none of the non-resident income uh, that, that, that's being earned in the state by, non -re by non-resident workers. The combination of a local sales tax and a statewide flat tax would hit both of those uh, uh, income sources. Having a statewide sales tax just doubles up on hitting tourists and leaves non-resident workers entirely alone. Paul says, that's horse hooey. Sales tax is going to be higher than the PFD cut um, in in total. Um, and I don't know if they are independent or separate. I mean, they're talking about still doing both, right, Brad? Uh, yeah, so the balanced, the balanced uh, approach uh, has $600 million in, uh, this is scenario five of the governor's OMB plan, uh, has a 10-year plan, it has $600 million uh, uh, this is average over the 10 years, $600 million in spending cuts below spending plus inflation. This isn't, I mean, these are, these are, we're not even talking about, about the level of cuts that's required below the status quo. That's, those are huge cuts. This is $600 million below inflation. And then PFD restructuring uh, to POMV 5050 frees up $700 million on average, uh, 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 annual uh, average. Um, and then say, and then whatever the tax uh, increment is, uh, the the ten year plan has it at five hundred million dollars. It's for a total of one point eight billion dollars. We'll, we'll we'll come back to why that one point eight billion dollars is important here in the second segment. But but what they're trying to do is fill a one point eight billion dollars annual uh, hole uh, in the budget, which is uh, which is where we are. What you know? What what's your response, uh, 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 Brad? To because again, I mean, in my spirit. I am totally against taxes. I mean, I, I just feel like they've had enough money. They have not shown themselves to be fiscally responsible adults with what they have. And the idea, uh, the actual even concept of giving them more uh, just seems like, uh, you, know, re you know, rewarding bad behavior and will lead us down a road to where this really never solves the problem. Because, again, my fear is, is they'll just consume all the oxygen in the room because they can. What's your response to people who who come forward and say no taxes without cuts, period? Because you know all the good reasons that I just laid out. What what what's your response to them? Well, I I, I think that's fair, and I think Scenario Five, the governor's OMB Scenario Five, incorporates that. It says we'll have a three part plan, roughly a third, a third, a third, uh, a third in uh, in cuts below uh, uh, spending plus inflation. Uh, a third in POMB restructuring and a third in uh, in in other taxes uh, to try to to try to fill this 1.8 billion dollar annual uh, hole that we have. I, what, what so I think that's fine. I think I think yes, cuts plus uh, the other two steps. Cuts only isn't going to get it, and we can t we'll talk about that in the second segment. But but cuts plus is 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 I think cuts is part of a it's part of an overall package. Is the is is the right approach. What real what what is not realistic, frankly to me, and and again we've been at this ten years. What's what, what's not realistic anymore is to say cuts first, cuts only, um, and then we'll talk about taxes later on. Well, we tried that last session. We tried cuts only, and as you and I talked about last week after the supplemental, we will have less than a hundred million dollars in cuts after all of the trouble, all of the battle, all of the effort last year. We're going to end up with less than a hundred million dollar uh, million dollars in cuts, and we have a one point five billion dollar hole. And after all of the effort last year, we're going to end up with less than a hundred million dollars um, in cuts. We tried that. The governor tried that. The governor put out a budget that 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 was basically cuts only. He couldn't even get sixteen to support the level of cuts that required. He finally got sixteen. When he when he sort of added back six hundred million dollars in spending, uh, but then even that didn't hold, and we ended up we ended up even worse off. So we've tried cuts only, and and to, and to continue and say I'm going to hold my breath until I get cuts only, and only then will I talk about taxes. All that's doing is creating the condition year after year after year for PFD cuts. 
because we don't do cuts only. We didn't do cuts only last year. We haven't done it for the last 10 years. We're, we didn't. We don't do cuts only, and we get to the end of the session, and the only thing the legislature's got to grab is PFD cuts uh, to, to fund to fund the whole, and then we go on to the next year. Um, so those who say I'm going to hold my breath until we do cuts only, and then I'll start talking about taxes maybe the year after that. Well, uh, you, what, well all you're doing is setting up the condition for for year on year PFD cuts. That's all that's happening as a result of that position. If if we have cuts spending cuts as part of a total package that that really durably finally tries to fill the the deficits we're running then great but holding your breath and saying cuts only before i'll talk about anything else uh is just unrealistic and 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 you're just feeding into the kathy giesel natasha von imhoff um uh jennifer johnston uh, approach uh well we gotta use pfd cuts because we didn't do we, we didn't make all these spending cuts so we just right. got, we gotta <clears throat> use P, pfds to fill it in yep Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. This is always a, this is always a hard sell for folks uh, here in the chat room and for folks listening, I know, because, again, our inclination is to say no new taxes until these guys have cut, you know, the spending, the excess spending. Uh, and I agree. In my heart of hearts, I agree with that. The problem is they're not doing it. Now, maybe we can change that this next election cycle. Maybe we can make that work. But if not, we need to at least direct the conversation in a way that is the least detrimental to us. Uh, maybe you think that that's uh, stinking thinking or defeatist thinking. Uh, I like to think of it as strategery. Strategery. That's what I'm working on right now. Number two deals with the spending cap. We've got to actually squeeze a lot in here in this last segment. Spending cap, Brad. Um, uh, the spending cap that we keep talking about would be our salvation if it's factored correctly. Unfortunately, the spending cap that they seem to want to be pushing out there uh, is a spending cap based on uh, spending instead of on income, uh, which seems completely backwards to anybody who's ever done a budget to say, I need a spending cap on my budget, uh, and I'm going to base it on what I'm currently spending instead of on what I'm actually taking in and making. Uh, It seems counterintuitive, and uh, you've actually got some charts that show just that. Well, this was part of the presentation of the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly last last week, and 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 and, and I got a deer in the headlights look uh, when I put up one chart uh, that I think may be the most critical chart, the most important chart uh, that's out there, and that is to show what capping, uh, what, what the what the result is of capping spending at at current levels, even a little bit reduced levels. Uh, and then escalating it by inflation, as as most of the uh, spending caps out there that people talk about uh, uh, do, and and so you you cap spending at about 4.6, 4.5 doesn't matter. I mean, pick a pick a four number. Uh, you cap spending at that, and you escalate it by inflation. And and if you talk to legislators, they'll say, well, that's the solution. We're going to cap spending, and 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 that'll be the solution. The problem is. <laughs> Current law revenues don't even approach that level of spending. Cur- uh, current law revenues, and by current law, I mean uh, uh, taking out the full statutory PFD. So revenues that are traditional revenues, uh, oil revenues plus the, the existing other taxes plus uh, the portion of the SB26 draw that's remaining uh, after you take out the statutory PFD. Current law, the revenues that, that are available under current law. Uh, for 2021 is a little over three billion dollars. The spending cap that people talk about—I mean, pick a four number. The 4.6 is the one that the that the uh, the governor's tenure uh, governor's tenure plan uses. But pick 4.5. Pick 4.4. I don't care. The revenues are three billion dollars. Next year, 2022, we think we have it bad. This year, next year, current law revenues are 2.8 billion dollars. 2023 revenues are $2.8 billion. 2024 revenues, current law revenues, are $3.1 billion. 2025 revenues are $3 billion. 2026 revenues are $3 billion. 2027 revenues are $3.2 billion. 2028 revenues are $3.3 billion. You notice there's not a four in here, right? right. 2029 revenues are $3.4 billion. 2030, uh, 2030 revenues are $3.4 billion. Well, if you start with the spending cap that's in the fours someplace, 
um, 4.5, 4.6, 4.4, you know, pick it, uh, and escalate that by inflation, <laughs> you're, you're, you're leaving all these revenues. I mean, there, none of these revenues touch that level. By Let's just pick a, a, a year, 2026, starting, sp- starting the spending cap of 4.6, which is significantly below, I'll tell you, uh, I'll say, what, what most people say the starting point are, is, but starting spending at 4.6, escalated by 2025, that's a $4.9 billion spending number. Revenues in 2025 are $3 billion. Over the course of the 10 years, we run an ar- annual average $1.8 billion deficit. Right. If you, if there's, that's 33%, uh, 35% actually, of spending. 35% per spending, percent of spending, even with a spending cap at inflation. Capped at inflation, 35% of the budget is in deficit. That, that, and that results in an annual average of $1.8 billion in deficit over the 10 years, even with a spending cap, $1.8 billion in deficit over the 10 years, even with a spending cap. So that's why when you look at Scenario 5, the governor's balanced approach, it's got a combination of Spending reductions, $600 million annual average in spending reductions, plus about $700 million in uh, PFD restructuring, additional revenues freed up as a result of PFD restructuring, plus $500 million in new taxes. That's $1.8 billion. That matches the deficit even with a spending cap. And that assumes, that balanced approach assumes $600 million in annual reductions uh, uh, of, of, of spending cuts below the spending cap. I'll come back to something we talked about just a moment ago. Last year, after all of the effort, all of the, all of the, all of the work everybody did, we're going to end up with less than $100 million in spending reductions. And even Scenario 5 contemplates $600 million a year in spending reductions. That's a huge stretch in and of itself. There is no way that we get $1.8 billion in annual average spending reductions um, uh, out of this legislature or, frankly, any legislature. What do you think that, uh, you know, I mean, because we were just talking about maybe we change the players and maybe we get some of this done. People are saying if we tax now, if we change the, the even if we change the players on this next election, if we tax now, we're, we're kind of toast to begin with because we don't give them a chance to get caught up. Um, but I mean, I mean, what's the chances of a tax actually passing right now with what we have right now? I mean, I think we're still in flux. What do you say? Well, we have taxes. I mean, PFD cuts are taxes. We've had those. We've had those since 2016. People who say no taxes are just, I mean, I don't, I don't know what planet they're on because we've had taxes since 2016. They're targeted, they're targeted taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent dancing all the way to the back bank. We've had taxes. We're going to continue to have taxes. The question is whether we have these taxes, the PFD cuts, or we have more equitable taxes. But we're going to have taxes. There, there, the, 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 the level of cuts that would be required to get down to traditional revenues is unrealistic. It's not going to happen. We found that out last legislature. And so we're going to continue to have taxes. The only question is, what kind of taxes are we going to have? Are we going to continue to have these hugely regressive uh, uh, taxes targeted on middle and lower income Alaska families, or are we going to have a fairer tax approach under which all Alaskans uh, and non-residents uh, contribute? Um, and, and that's really that's the debate. I mean, people who say spending cuts, spending cuts, oh, cuts only, uh, they're, they're, they've, they've pushed themselves out of the margin. We haven't done it. We haven't done it for the last 10 years. It's not going to be done. We found that out last year. Even if we elect an entirely new legislature, they're not going to find $1.8 billion per year in, in, in spending cuts. Keep in mind that last year 
we're going to, even after all that effort, we end up uh, uh, cutting less than $100 million right. uh, out of the budget. They say, Brad, you never talk about oil taxes. Well, we have talked about oil taxes, and there is some room on the table for oil taxes, just not $1.2 billion worth, which is what the fair share people are talking about. I think you and I have talked about numbers somewhere in the $400 million range, potentially, of, of potential taxes that may be left on the table without damaging investment in the industry. Am I, am I on target there? I think. Okay. So, I mean, we have talked about it in the past. We just, we haven't rehashed it every week. But, but here, I mean, here, here's the point. I, I had this discussion the other day with somebody who said oil taxes, that's the solution. That solves it all. We have a $1.8 billion deficit, even on its best day. Those who argue for oil taxes uh, say that they're around the billion to a billion two range. That still leaves $600 million. Uh, in terms of in terms of deficit, what people are not getting their arms around is the size of de- over the last ten years, the size of deficit that we've run up and we've run out of reserves to pay for is huge, one point eight billion dollars annual average, even with the spending cap uh, over the next over the next uh, ten years. That that's huge, and and there's no one solution other than PFD cuts, and and you have to use the entire PFD to pay for it. Uh, that you, you essentially have to tax away the entire PFD. There's no single solution that sol- the single bullet that, that solves this issue. Yep, I'm, I'm I'm with you on this. So again, you look at that chart, and I'm going to show the chart one more time for those in the chat room who missed it this last time. Just look at that number and look at where we're at, even with a spending cap, just based on where we're going right now. Just if you lift left it at the rate of inflation, that's just a static spend at the rate of inflation. You look at those numbers and you realize $1.8 billion pretty much every year moving forward on average going out. Uh, I mean, it's just it's it, there's just something is fundamentally broken and they're going to have to pay for it. And it's going to be some form of tax because I don't think that they're going to cut. I don't think that they want to cut some of this stuff out of there. Um, I mean, this is a this is a, a pretty tough deal. Now, whether you say it's a sales tax that fixes it or an income tax or a flat tax or whatever else it is. There's just there's no it's going to be something, and on top of it, they're going to cut the P, the PFD. Even if we incorporate the POMV with fifty fifty, you're going to see a reduced PF, uh, PFD, and those monies are going to go into the state coffers as well. Which again really makes me nervous because again of their fiscal irresponsibility. Brad, I'll let you uh, finish up here. Michael, we, we we have we have spent the last ten years saying if we don't fix this, Armageddon's going to come. We're going to have to pay taxes. We're going to have to have to uh, uh, have have PFD cuts. Scott Goldsmith was saying that back in 2009. There's a paper he wrote back in 2009 that said in the early 2020s, if we don't fix this situation, we're going to be having PFD cuts and we're going to have to pay pa- taxes by the time we get to the early 2020s. This Armageddon, we've talked about it for the last 10 years. It's not like it snuck up on us. Well, the future has come. The future is now. We, we, we have finally hit the wall. And what's caused us to hit the walls, we've run, run through all the savings. There's no CBR left. There's no SBR left in order to, in order to bridge us over to have this discussion for, for another year. We have hit the wall. And, and we actually hit the wall four years ago when they started doing PFD taxes. It's, it's, we, we've got to face up to it. And just sticking your head in the sand and saying, oh, we'll just do cuts only. We'll, 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 we'll send legislators back who will do cuts only. No, it's not going to happen, folks. And if you keep sticking your head in the sand, all you're doing is signing up for deeper and deeper and deeper PFD cuts, PFD taxes to pay for this over the, over the, over the next 10 years. If that's what you want, if you think PFD taxes is the right way to go, then just you know keep putting your head in the sand. But if, but if you really want to solve this problem in a way that's durable, in a way that's equitable, start facing up to the fact that there are much more equitable ways to do this than PFD cuts. Um, and, and we need to be talking about those other more equitable ways. Michael says, Brad, the cuts are going to happen because we're going broke. And to that, I would say, and I'll let you respond, but to that, I would say, well, the cuts are going to happen because we're going broke, but only the only way we'll go broke is after they've taken the entire PFD to pay for all of the government spending, and then they'll admit we're broke, and then they'll be looking for new taxes anyway. Exactly right. I mean, we've seen where they're going. PFD cuts. Listen to Natasha Imhoff. Listen to Kathy Giesel. Listen to Jennifer Johnson. They are going to go after the PFD, folks. It's not there. There's not going to be cuts because we're broke. 
they view the PFD as a pot of money, and they're just going to keep dipping into it as long as they possibly can. And then, after the entire PFD is gone, when the top 20% might, might finally have to face paying taxes, then they may face up to it. But in the meantime, they're just going to keep taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. It, it's, it, there is no correction to this as long as the PFD money sits out there. We need to find a, a different way to, to provide those revenues that's much more equitable and, frankly, to get the top 20 percent involved in paying them so they then get triggered to, 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 to curb in spending. Right now, the top 20 percent doesn't care. They're, I mean, it's being financed, the additional spending is being financed by PFD cuts. doesn't affect them. They don't care. They have no skin in the game to try to curb spending. And so they keep saying, well, you know, we got PFD cuts, so we'll just finance it through PFD cuts. Getting them engaged by making them pay a portion of the costs of, of this continued spending will, will, will do more to curb spending going forward than anything else. Yep. Let's. Uh, we're coming down to the end here, Brad, so I do want to touch on number three. If folks want to argue with you or if they want to see both sides of these arguments, you've got a debate going on uh, coming up tonight, in fact, at 49th State Brewing Company in Anchorage here. They're holding a forum. Uh, give me the quick 45-second uh, rundown. Alaska Common Ground is putting on a debate that has four different segments. Uh, the first segment is, is an argument about uh, cuts only. Um, and and that'll be interesting. The second argument is about using PFD cuts uh, to, uh, to to solve uh, the the entirety of the fiscal picture. Essentially, 1.8 billion dollars in annual PFD cuts. Uh, the third uh, segment is on uh, substituting other forms of revenue for PFD cuts. That's the that's the segment that I'm on, on and I'll be arguing for using other forms of revenue to substitute for PFD cuts. And the and the final argument is on oil taxes. All right, that's tonight, uh, 7 p.m. at uh, 49th State uh, here in Anchorage. If you want to do it, they'll also have it up on their website for Alaska Common Ground afterwards. It should be an interesting discussion. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for coming in, my friend. Appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. For those of you interested in the debate we discussed in the third segment, a reminder that we will post it on these same pages later this week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.